Well, here we are again. And this time, I think I'm finally going to start working on getting this ignition control put in that I want to do. So, what I'm going to do, you can actually already see that this area, of course, is empty um, because I have the radio up here. And so, I am going to take this switch panel that you might have seen in a previous video. Um, that's set up to go on a PT Cruiser dash for a future, future installation. But for now, I've got a plenty of these plastic things anyways, so I'm going to trim this one a little bit. And I think for now, I'm just going to get it mounted like right there. Then I still got space to the right of it for my snacks. And then that will be the main ignition control panel. But of course, there will be a subsequent panel that will be to the left. And then there's also going to be a separate key switch that will kill power to it um, if I do have concerns of, you know, wanting to make it uh, more secure. Um, obviously, when I go to use this ignition switch panel, the ignition tumbler is going to be removed entirely. Thus, I won't have steering lock, um, but I mean, the likelihood that anybody's going to steal this ugly thing that has shark teeth on the side of it and it's, you know, obviously a piece of shit. Um, well, the plan is to install this here soda fountain key switch here. Um, because the nice thing about it is you can contact it on and remove the key. So you can remove the key whether it's in the on or the off position. The switch is rated for 4 amps at 125 volts AC. That's great plenty. And we're not going to be running much load out of this anyways. It's only going to be for power going to the relays. Uh, as far as the relay bank is concerned that I built, this is what I've got. So I've got a bank of seven relays, and they're all going to get fed power via this large line here. So I'll put a fuse in the line, and so you've got main power coming in, and then this is all the main powers that'll be coming out. So it's all the outputs for the relays. This little thin one is a ground. Um, so these are going to go to like the ignition leads, HVAC leads, uh, radio, all that kind of stuff. And then this big coil here has much thinner wires in it, which I may or may not need to extend. We'll see. And these are going to go to the toggle switches. So the toggle switches won't be carrying much power. But either way, the power that will feed the toggle switches to turn on and off is going to come from the key switch. So you're going to have, we're going to have power going into the switch. And if the switch is on, the power goes out to this little rotation switch, which will also have a little indicator light on, just for fun. So it'd be one of those things where you have to have this switch rotated, that key on, and then you go through the toggle process. And then there's actually three separate push buttons that you'll see the how they work together as far as the start function is concerned. It's completely pointless, completely stupid, but uh, it's kind of fun. All right, so I went ahead and I found some wire. Uh, this wire is a good bit thicker than it needs to be. But um, I just got a bunch of these cheapy little female disconnects. You know, they don't actually have the nice um, um, plastic around it. You know, and those, those are nicer, but they're a little more expensive. I tend to just buy these cheap ones here. And then uh, I'll just put a little bit of shrink tube around it and make my own. And, I mean, these cheapy little sets of shrink tube, and anyways, I mean... You get a bunch of these 9.30 seconds and 5.16 pieces that you're not using very often anyways, it seems. So that's perfect. Cut it in half, and then I can uh, kind of shield that up. And then so I went ahead and drilled the hole on the side of the uh, uh, center console here so where it's easy enough to reach. So then I can connect these wires up, and then I can run them forward. And I'm going to make sure to leave myself enough extra here, too, so that way... When I go to remove the center console next time, it's not like hard to uh, unplug and plug this in. I want to make sure I have enough extra slack. All right, so where we're at right now here is I've got the wires here that are going to go to the little ignition switch. They are run and tucked all the way behind and underneath the carpet. And then they kind of come up here. Um, this one is currently just sitting down here. And so this is what's going to feed the switch. It's going to be the red with the white stripe is actually going to feed the switch. And I chose that because this is actually shorter than this one, so that's fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to steal power generally from the back of, like, the fuse panel or the headlight switch. And I'm actually going to use the headlight switch because um, the headlight switch has, like, a couple, two power wires or so here 
that are thick um, and carry plenty of juice. And like I said, we're not really carrying much load here anyways. This thickness of this wire is overkill. Um, so I'm going to tap into one of these. And what I'm going to do is, because I don't really have an inline fuse laying around, I'm just going to use a short piece of wire that I'm going to tap into one of these feeds. And then I'll have these two female disconnects that I can poke out by the fuse panel side. And um, this side's going to have a shrink tube just like this. This one's not shrunk yet. Um, and then I can put a fuse in. And so that way that line that runs all the way through here is fused. So should something happen and ground it out over here, it will pop this fuse and the fuse will be accessible at the fuse panel here. So that's what I'm going to do for that. And then thinking ahead as I'm kind of prepping some other wires here, I'm going to take this wire here, which is a not focusable, come on, there we go, uh, white with a red stripe. And so basically this wire is going to run from the left all the way over to the right side where the toggle switches are. So this wire is going to feed the power from that little rotating switch over to the toggle switch. And then I've also gone ahead and used a thin little piece of wire here, just a black with a white stripe, and I twisted it together and I managed to actually put them both into the same connector. Uh, I squeezed the plastic a little bit, that would be more of an oval shape and you could actually fit them in there. And so that's going to work for that end. And then because this is a thin wire, um, the little thing that I like to do is I twist up the wire and then I fold it over on itself. That way it's got a little more meat when putting it into one of these little red female disconnects and I squeeze it down and it'll have something to grip on. So I'll get this stuff kind of plumbed in and then we'll touch base again on what we're looking at there. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to take the wire strippers and I'm going to find the gauge that fits the nicest. In this case it looks like 16. Kind of like, you know, you don't want it to, to close all the way over but you want it to like close most of the way over. You just got to kind of make a judgment call. And I'm just going to bite down. That way it's just cutting through the insulation and not the wire. And then I'm going to move about, I'm say a quarter of an inch back. Bite down again. And so now, it's probably hard to see on the camera, I've got two spots where I've bit right through the insulation. And then I'm going to take a razor blade. And I'm just going to slice the length of the insulation carefully so as not to cut yourself. Set that back down. And then I can take my thumbnail and I can open up this piece of insulation here. And remove that section of insulation. And then, what I'm going to do, because whenever I'm doing these projects, I have a test light with me anyways. I'm going to take the sharp part of the test light. And I'm just going to kind of, the best I can, right into the middle of the... The wire to try to make it so that it's an even amount of wire on either side and now I've poked the test light <clears throat> through the wire and now we have a nice little hole there this way then I could take the wire that I want to tap put it through that hole wrap the wire around now the best way to do this of course would then be to take a soldering iron and solder and you know close this up and make sure it's really good and tight um i don't always solder all the connections it really kind of depends on what i'm doing in this case i know i'm going to have this apart again because this system is going to be you know fixed up a little bit as i go i'm going to go ahead and actually i'm going to bend the wire this way and i'm just gonna close it up with a little bit of electrical tape like so in fact i'm going to go ahead and wrap this other wire around it just to keep it about as neat as possible and there we go so now I've got that little red wire tapped in to this power just like I want for when it makes a connection and another thing I'm gonna have to do here is these um, female disconnects are actually a little bit too big um, they do make some skinnier ones that's common that you see with aftermarket speakers so I'm gonna have to get some of those because of course uh, as you can kind of see here, these terminals are rather small. So for the moment, uh, I just kind of gave this a little bit of a squeeze so it bites a little tighter. And then I can at least put it down on half of it. It needs to go a little tighter yet. <clears throat> so we're going to give her a little more of a bite. And then slide it back on that half. Oh, there we go. That's pretty good. And kind of same thing there. So those 
have a decent connection, at least for now anyways. So now, with this connected, I've got, um, here's my power coming in. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, yes, yeah, power coming in. So this is going to be power coming in from the key switch. And then down here, I've got that fused spot that I've built. So let me go ahead and let's toss a fuse in it for testing at the moment. And now, there we go. Now we're functional. As well as these switches. Now these two push buttons are actually tied together. So I've got my power coming in here, coming out, going into the next switch, and then coming out. And the only reason for this is so you have to push both, bu both buttons at the same time. There's no real reason. It's you, You'll see. You know, it's just stupid, but it's what we do. So this way, my test light, push one button, one button, nothing happens. Push both buttons, and you get your light. And it's just kind of all a little bit of trickery and confusery. And then with this off, you've got nothing. So that's perfect. This is coming together. All right, so now we just got to uh, run some more wires and tuck some stuff up on this side, and then we can get to work on the other side and plumbing in that big relay mess. I want to take a quick second to talk about electrical tape. You can get cheap electrical tape that's like a dollar a roll, but it is garbage. For years, I would always use the cheap garbage because I didn't know any better, especially if you're working in cold temperatures. If you're working in any sort of cold temperatures, cheap electrical tape just doesn't work. The only chance you have to get it work is put it between your, between your butt cheeks and try to get it warmed up. And even on top of that, when it does work, let's say in the summertime, it doesn't stay sticky. It comes apart. So after a year, your tape job is opening up, you're getting moisture, you're getting all sorts of problems. I use this 3M scotch that won't focus. Holy shit. Come on now. Christ. It's the uh, 30, the Super 33 or 33 Plus, something like that. And I think they have like an 88 or something that's really good too. Um, this stuff is great. It does cost a bit more. I mean, you're talking, what, maybe four or five bucks a roll, something like that? I don't really pay attention to the price, to be honest. Um, but you get a nice amount and... It is so worth it. Oh, my God. Uh, even in the cold, this stuff works great. It stays sticky. It stays together. So the example is, as I'm working on the wiring here, This uh, I opened this up, loom up, and I have this circuit breaker here, which and I know this is, this is pretty bad. It's ghetto. It's typical. This is actually my starter relay because the original starter circuit, something went haywire and fucked off on it, and I just made my own starter circuit. Um, this has been wrapped up like this for probably three years now and I have not unwrapped it I have not redone it and it's just stayed nicely wrapped and I'm actually going to open this up because I'm going to use this as part of my feed because I've got a nice like 20 amp circuit breaker right here so this is this is a perfect place to to get my power so I'm going to unwrap this and let's just see how clean it looks underneath there we go I managed to find the end and unwrap the whole thing it's quite a bit I know but that's three years, and it's still pliable, and it's even still tacky. So, like, if you had to do a roadside repair and you had to unwrap a wire, you could actually, if you really needed to, reuse it. But here she is. She's clean. There's no corrosion. No issues. Um, what amperage is this thing? You know, honestly, it doesn't even say. Maybe it does underneath one of the terminals, but at any rate, it doesn't matter. I actually cut the terminals shorter because they were sticking out so far. But, yeah, I mean, look at that. That's great. And, I mean, this has been plenty wet under here. I've taken this car on the state trails. I had to rescue a Polaris Ranger that broke down in the trails, and we used the car to do it. Splashed through Penny of Puddles. And some of you might have seen the other video where well, this thing went through one heck of a puddle, and enough that, well, my really bad design intake uh, just kind of take a good drink and, well, you know, bent and broke and things, things didn't go well. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I can't use cheap electrical tape anymore. You've got to use the good 3M stuff or nothing. Another tidbit is it's a lot of fun trying to get wires through the firewall. So here is a handy little trick. You can use your dipstick. 
Uh, I have a spare one here that's already broken anyway, so it's perfect for this. But basically, I am going to, I've already poked a hole in this rubber boot anyways, but you can poke a hole in the side of this rubber boot and then shove your dipstick through somewhere. Not so good with one hand here, apparently. I've already got a bunch of crap shoved through here, and that sure doesn't help. But anyways, we'll shove our dipstick through, and then when the dipstick comes through the inside, we can tape the wire that we want to pull through to the dipstick, and then carefully pull the dipstick back out, and it should bring the wire with it. There we go. Sure enough, there it is. There's the dipstick. So now... We're just going to tape the wire really good to the end of the dipstick using the good stuff, and we'll pull her through. Alright, so this time I wrapped it up a little better. I actually stripped the wire back a little bit so I could get a better bite on it. And last time it, get, it got about halfway through. So here's where it's hard right now. So I'm just trying to... Damn. Okay, we're, we're not chooched yet. It did let go, but it's partially through the hole. So I'm going to see if I can grab it with the needle nose and pull it through. I can grab it with the needle nose, one-handed. Not maybe so easy, but I'm going to try. I think I got it. Let's see. Oh, look at that. See? <laughs> I didn't completely screw up. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Just... You know, took a second try, that's all. There we go. Stacked and connected. Now we just gotta tape her up. And taped up. I went, started here. I went all the way over once, and then came back. And I even left a little bit of a flag here so it's easy enough to unwrap in the future. At this point, I just gotta kind of tuck it all back together and make it look acceptable. And there we go. All right, so back at it again. It's actually the next day. Is uh, got a little lazy last night after dinner and just didn't feel like coming back out to continue on the project. So before I get uh, a little further with interior stuff on the car, I figured I should finish up a little bit on this. What I need to do here primarily is I need to make some, some jumpering connections. I need to jumper the grounds, and I need to jumper the power for each one of these. So you've got power, load, and ground. Uh, so the point of the grounds, of course, is basically just to operate the LED light that lights up when the unit's on, which is exactly why it's important to make sure you have power on the power side, and then whatever accessory you're plugging in is going to be on the load side in the middle, which is just going to trigger our relays. So once again, it's not it's not uh, carrying a heavy load or nothing. So I got some little pieces of black wire, and I am going to make some little jumpered connections between each other. Just simply just kind of putting them together and inside these female disconnects, just like I did prior. Except with these ones, because these are ground, I'm not going to worry about um, putting shrink tubing over them or nothing. Because it's a ground anyways, it's not like it's going to short out on nothing. So we're going to get these little pieces hooked up here and I'll show you what that looks like when that's done. Alright, so there we go. I've got this little daisy chain made up of grounds with one open lead. And the idea here is we are going to simply connect these grounds to the ground sides on all these switches. And the only reason I'm not soldering them straight to the switches, which would, you know, maybe make it a little cleaner and save some some connectors is because I'd still like to be able to pull the switches out if I have a bad switch or a different issue. And then this little lead of this ground, I'm actually going to tin to this tiny toggle. And then the tiny toggle will get another wire tinned to it for ground. And the whole idea behind this tiny toggle is it'll actually disconnect the ground. The idea of disconnecting the ground being if I'm driving somewhere out in the sticks late at night, like back and forth to my place in Wisconsin, if I decide that the lights on these toggles are a little bit bright or distracting, um, you can hit the toggle over and it'll cut the ground, thus all the lights will go out. And it's just kind of a little more uh, easier to see at night sometimes. I mean, these lights aren't too bright, but they do got a little bit of a lightness to them. And when they're in the upright position, they are shining kind of up towards the driver a bit. So that's the whole point of that is just to be able to cut that uh, the, the ground signal off entirely. In fact, this is on and this is off. 
but it doesn't matter. That's fine by me. <laughs> so I'm going to get this tinned in, and then I'm also going to get a power wire set up with a daisy chain just like this for the power wires on the outside. Well, so here we are at, I've got the wire soldered into the toggle switch. I actually had to replace the toggle switch because the first one didn't go so well and uh, the solder wasn't taking well. Got the switch too hot, pulled the blade right out of it. These are just such cheap little disposable toggle switches anyway, so it don't matter. Um, but at least now I can have it in the kind of the direction that I want where this is on and this is off, which will feel more fluid. So that's a, a bonus. Um, but I also went ahead and I did just like I did with the grounds. I went ahead and I did a red jumper that is sending power to all six toggle switches on the power side exactly like labeled. So that way then, when I go to install this in the car, I can choose what loads I want where to control what relays. And they don't even have to necessarily control relays. I could run some fairly low amperage uh, stuff powering out of this. Like, for example, my uh, GPS that might actually be powered just straight from one of these switches instead of um, worrying about going through a relay because the power level is, is not even an amp anyways. So I guess it's time now um, to kind of get it in the car, but I do still need mounting holes. So I think I should chuck this up into this super tiny vise of mine and uh, see about making some mountain holes in it. All right, there we go. Got her mounted up with a couple of screws. She's nice and solid, very satisfying clickiness. Guess back to the car now, finally. So when I was originally gonna mount this panel, the plan was eventually to put a second gen steering column in here, which would actually remove the headlight switch from here. And so I was going to do brackets to mount it down there. But then I realized, well, in this particular car, I don't use these forward vents anyways. I mean, I could turn them on, but with the radio there, it's kind of deflected anyways. So why not, why not just mount this little guy in here for now, you know? I could just mount it right up there, and it's good enough for the time being. I could always make a bracket for the bottom of it later if I wanted, but this is a simple fix. And once again, it's just shit plastic that's already been painted. It's already got a hole in it, and... You know, in the Midwest, we don't have as much of a problem with these plastics breaking apart as they do in other places, so we have extras. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll just, I'm just going to mount that right there. The other two wires that I have in here that I forgot to mention is, you see there's this gray wire that right now I just have run up, and that is going to be for power for uh, the GPS and the pillar pods. Um, and then this other little wire here, the, the very final switch, I actually have running to, I had a temporary switch in there, a little round silver one, and that's for the lighting underneath the car. There is a strip of red and a strip of green underneath the car, kind of like uh, navigation lights on aircraft. Once again, it just goes with the whole goofy theme of the vehicle. So I wanted to mention that I added those in, that way it's not confusing extra later as to where those switches came from. So now I'm finally going to try to get this thing shoved in here. All right, I managed to get it shoved in. I still haven't buttoned up steering column and other stuff yet, but it's finally time to test the system. So obviously we have to make sure the key is on, which typically is gonna be in the on position and then the key will just be on my key set. I need to turn on the switch over on the left. I have an indicator light on the left that tell me the power is on. And then it's simply a matter of turning on the ignition system, HVAC, radio, and then any other switches and things you might want. And then to start, I'm gonna hold both buttons on the left and hit this one. Just like that, we are operational. Obviously, these ones don't need to be on because they're not really doing anything right now. This one will be for the navigation, the, the GPS and all that. But now we simply can shut off whichever components we want. So there we go. Just like that. And if the key happens to be in the off position, you get nothing. No power whatsoever. Nope, nothing. So that's kind of, uh, it's kind of stupid, 
but fun. I enjoy it. I think uh, I'm pretty happy with the outcome of this. Really, you only need the one on to fire it. It's good stuff. And then test the ground cutout switch. That works. Nice. And you know what? We should test even more thoroughly somewhere. Had to find the keys. And that still works. And this should still work regardless of this key position. Yep, even if that key is off, remote start still functions. So there we go. That's looking pretty good. Now I just got to button the rest of this up and uh, we'll go for a final uh, inspection. All right, so a couple days have passed. Um, and tonight I finally got the motivation to get back in the garage and start working on this thing again. I uh, <coughs> pulled the uh, top part of the dash apart, which obviously needs a lot of work anyway, since it's actually kind of just falling apart even more. So I'm going to bring that into the house and try to fix it up. Um, but uh, the toggle switch system is actually working correctly, and I even labeled it now. So now I'm kind of adding the extra couple of things to it. I'm moving one of the power sources for uh, my navigation stuff. And then I'm going to install what I'm going to call the Annoyerator 5000. <sighs> this little bastard that I whipped together <coughs> serves no actual functional purpose other than to be mildly annoying for a few seconds, and it sort of satisf satisfies me. It's stupid. And it's kind of a callback to some terrible 70s technology that was prevalent in every 70s and 80s vehicle, and it was a rather annoying little buzzing sound whatnot. Oddly enough, I haven't had a lot of luck finding one of the original buzzers uh, that you'd, you'd think I'd have one laying around, and there's nothing old enough ever in the junkyard. So I actually got uh, these two little piezo buzzers off of uh, eBay or Amazon for, it was Amazon, for dirt cheap. A pack of like five of them for a few bucks. <clears throat> and I've got a couple of these timer boards, which are only a couple of bucks. And um, I can actually dial in the time on this timer, and I've actually got two of them. So there's one for each buzzer. And they also operate um, a really dumb light. That, um, you'll see when this is operational too. But I'm going to go ahead and, and shove this thing in there. And I wanted to show it to you um, because in the final little clip of this video, when we show the actual functional test of it, you're going to hear it and you're going to see the lights and you're probably going to wonder, you know, where that came from or what it does. So I wanted to make sure I, I put this in there to show. Oh, and yeah, they are strapped back together. Um, there's a piece of cardboard in between and they're literally just zip tied together. It's just a, it's a junky little thing. I'm going to throw a little bit of electrical tape around and across the top just to make sure it doesn't chance hitting something metal and shorten out but yeah i'm gonna wrap this bastard up and shove it on in the fucking hole and and you can see this is a spaghetti nightmare we got going on here uh, i mean this is all audio right here so this is all this is all for the radio and the media deck stuff um these are the, just the harnesses for uh the frost and fogs and then these little wires that i pulled up here <coughs> This is actually um, the Garmin charger for my GPS, which is crammed into a cigarette lighter and taped up. And so I'm changing the, the power source from its original source to, to my new source. Um, I pulled the remote starter up and out of the way because that normally, like I said, sits down in here. And so, yeah, I mean, it looks it looks more than it is. Oh, and this is actually part of the stereo system, too, is U, as, uh, two USB ports because it is an Android deck. And then that's for the uh, backup camera. So these actually technically go with that stuff too. You know, it's just, oh, that's my test light. Um, yeah, so I'm going to continue putting this disaster together. All right, so I've got the, the wiring kind of buttoned up for now. At this point, it's just a matter of fixing the uh, assembly for the radio, and then I can plug all that back in and get the radio back in. Right now I have this plugged in and just kind of chill in here. Like I said, the remote start unit module just kind of sits back over here. But so now... What we've got is we turn on the system power, which gives us the system ready light, which if that little key switch happens to be off, 
that won't function at all. None of it will work. <clears throat> like I said, in general, that key switch is just always going to be on. It's just going to be one of those things that if I'm concerned about it, I can sort of kill the system. Um, it's one of those things where it's already so confusing anyways that nobody's really going to figure it out on their own. <clears throat> Being it's a kind of aircraft theme, like I said, I was going to label things kind of like, um, you know, older uh, gas engine aircraft, you know, kind of a um, little more interesting. It's all for fun. Um, so like, for example, you've got uh, fuel prime, coil boost, and then the engine start button. And like I said, you have to push all three of them. And on a lot of older aircraft, um, you would have to do an extra step for priming the fuel system. Um, some of the aircraft would have separate power going to the uh, magnetos to sort of boost the spark during like a, a low crank and whatnot when the magneto might not be firing uh, a whole lot of juice right off the bat. And that's kind of common, I believe, with like the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines and stuff. And so that's why I kind of took that idea together. And so you know, nobody's really going to think, unless if they already know about this, that they have to hold... <laughs> these buttons, which when you push them on their own, I mean, they do nothing. Um, <clears throat> so then over here then, kind of same thing, the start button does nothing. So instead of ignition now, you've got mags, which would be of course short for magnetos. So you would flip your magnetos on, and that does activate the ignition system. So if they got far enough to turn on that switch and hit that switch and notice the ignition system is on, okay, they're to that point but they're going to sit there and engine start, and they're going to try other shit, and it's just not fucking going to work. Yeah, maybe eventually they'd figure it out, but I doubt they would stick around long enough to figure it out. So, <coughs> other things, um, the HVAC has now got that Annoyerator 5000 hooked up to it. So now, when we flip the HVAC switch above the uh, gauge cluster there, You've got water and fuel and glow plugs. And I know that's dumb. Obviously it's a gas engine. I just think it's kind of funny. It messes with people. I, I used this in my one of my previous trucks. So that's just kind of amusing. Um, turn off the fan there. And so comms, um, of course, would be like communications and whatnot which would power on the uh, radio amplifier, stuff like that. If I were to get crazy enough to put a CB radio in here, not that I honestly probably wouldn't because I'd never use the damn thing. Um, and then we have nav, obviously navigation. And so when you flip navigation on, there's navigation. It also applies power to the air fuel gauge and uh, my volt gauge up here, which is supposed to tell temperatures as well, but it is fucked. So I need to get a new one of those. Um, as you can see, my battery's not fantastic, but uh, whatever. All right, so now that I have everything all buttoned up back together, I've got the stereo all fixed up and everything, the start procedure, assuming the, the cutoff key is on, over here on the left, we have that panel. System power on, I've got a green check light, and then over here, we have the magnetos, in other words, the ignition, HVAC, Comms will be the radio, nav for communications, and then to start, like I said, all three buttons. And just like that. And then other stuff that'll come in later. So that way now, if I want, I can just cut out. Just like that. And if the switch is off, nothing. Same thing with... I don't have my keys on me. That's okay. But yeah, I don't need keys anymore. Still got to get a hole plug for this, but there we go. That's our stupid little project.